following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone. Welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. You're listening to Matt Slick Live. Today's date is, let's see, April 4th. 2024 for the podcasters and if you want to give me a call as usual all you have to do is dial 877-207-2276 and you can also email me just uh, send an email to info at karm.org and in this the uh, subject line put uh, karm question or radio question radio comment and we can get to you and we do that all right we have nobody waiting right now just a heads up, I'll be in a debate tonight uh, in two hours. I believe it's two hours. Isn't that right? Two hours from now? I think so. And I'll be debating uh, total depravity. And then next week, um, I'm supposed to be debating um, on does the Bible teach the deity of Christ or that Jesus is divine? And uh, I'll be debating that next week. I guess it's with a Muslim. I you know, Nadir, I think I've even talked to him before. I think I know. And so, uh, does the Bible teach it? <laughs> yeah, it does. And it's a topic that I'm well aware of and have debated countless times over the years. So, uh, there you go. Along with the doctrine of total depravity, what that means. So, you know, not a big deal, but there, there you go. So, hey, look, if you want to give me a call, 877 And, uh, like I said, you can give me an email, info at carm. C-A-R-M, info at carm.org, and uh, just put in radio comment, radio question in there, and that would be Mui Gado. That would be great if you could do that. All right. So we do have some of the uh, questions already, and I'll get to those, but uh, I started working on, um, on an article today. To me, it was interesting, and it, it, it happens every now and then. I'll start working on an article, and it becomes, to me, different than what I thought and becomes interesting and I'm working on the Catholic doctrine of the sacrament of reconciliation and um, it's it's you know I am so convinced the Roman Catholic Church is apostate <laughs> I mean I am so convinced it teaches a false gospel uh, and I was in a chat room um, a couple of days ago and uh, someone <laughs> Someone asked me, well, what do you think of the Catholic Church? I says, well, I think it teaches the false gospel and promotes idolatry. And man, <laughs> man, did it hit the fan. I'll tell you, people jumping up. You, you're the, <laughs> I don't know why I get a kick out of this, but I do. You're of Satan. You're a child of Satan <laughs> for saying you just insulted God's true church. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, they can't even see their own blindness. Well, like, how do you see blindness? At any rate, uh, they can't even see that uh, the Roman Catholic Church is just so unbiblical. And what I was doing was very politely just answering questions and showing stuff in Scripture. And I, mean, I would show them stuff in Scripture, and they always they ignored it it didn't matter what the bible says no that's not the issue the issue is where's what does the uh, church teach that's the issue the church is the ultimate authority not god's word and so i was called a child of the devil the son of satan uh because i'm a calvinist uh i was told uh that i was a, a satanist because of that <laughs> like wow <laughs> man so i thought it was kind of entertaining actually because I don't mind being insulted. Uh, I don't. I, you insult me. That's okay. You know, we'll talk. You know, I, I just want to know why you're saying that. And uh, I get a kick out of it. But man, oh, oh man, oh man, you can't. Uh, you cannot say anything against their church, right? Because oh, then you're the devil. And yet they can't back up what they teach from Scripture. And yet I'm the one who's wrong. It happens all the time like this. But anyway, I, I got a kick out of it. To me, that was. Uh, it was informative. It was interesting. And, uh, oh, my goodness, look at that. <laughs> what happened there? 
uh, get this going back up here. Let's see. Okay, come on. There we go. I did the camera. Oh, it is wigged out, the camera. So uh, I'm trying to get the position right here again. Let's see if we can. Nope, do this. Get back it over here. And then we'll get to uh, the callers. We'll get to uh, Rusty from South Carolina. Hey, Rusty, welcome. You're on the air. Hey. How you doing, Mr. Mack? I'm doing all right. Hang it in there, man. Hang in there. What do you got? Yes, sir. That's all that we can do. Um, so, okay. So, with the Bible, with the, with the Old Testament and New Testament, is it set up for us to understand it, like, for the past, present, and future? Yes. Mm-hmm. It is? What was, mm-hmm. okay. what was written in the Word of God is sir. written for instruction. It's, it's profitable for yes. teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that we can be adequately well, uh, equipped for every good work. That's Second Timothy three okay. sixteen and seventeen. So the Old Testament, New Testament is there, and it's inspired, and we're to study it. Study both of those doc, both yes. of those covenantal documents. Uh huh. Okay, so do you agree with when Jesus came to Earth? I mean, from my understanding, I, w- I just want to get a second opinion. Like when Jesus came to Earth, that was when. The end time started. I don't know if I'm well, that's a good question. question. Right, like, no, that's a really good question. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he came to Earth, is that when it happened, or at his death, or at his ascension? And I think we could make uh, an argument for each one, but I tend to lean towards the idea that it was at Pentecost. Now, I could be wrong. But uh, Peter says mm-hmm. in Acts two seventeen, you know, it, it shall be in the last days. You know, God will pour, pour forth His Spirit. So that means that Peter was in the last days when the Spirit was pour, uh, poured forth. Now the question is, when did that begin? Okay. So we know it's, it was existing wow. then. But did it begin when Christ arrived, when He was baptized, when uh, He was crucified? So there's some good mm-hmm. questions there. So I, I don't know how to exactly answer yeah. that one, but it's a good question. You gave me a good, okay, you, you kind of gave me something else to think about. I ain't know that about what you just said about the Pentecost. I, so mm-hmm. I'm, I haven't read that for you. Well, I have, but I didn't, I, I didn't take it in like that. I, I, but now when I read it again, I now, okay, that's why they said that the heaven of, the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes. Now he says that Jesus says that uh, at hand. Yeah, he said that too. Yes. Yeah, he said um, it before. So yes, uh, mm-hmm. and that's uh, yes, that's at Mark one fifteen. Uh, the time is fulfilled, and the yes. kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe the gospel, as Jesus said. So, the kingdom mm-hmm. of God. See, this your question is a good question because we could make the argument that yes. well, when it was here, when he arrived, or when he got baptized, I mean, you, you know, it, but. When he arrived, that's that's the fulfillment of so much. When he was born, yes, so sir. the kingdom of God is at hand because he is the king. So we could say that the last yes, days sir. began with Christ, you know, as he was born. We could say that. That's a good yeah. question. Good yeah. question. I don't know what the right answer is. Though. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you gave me something to think about. Thank you. That that that's, <laughs> that I love the fellowship. Thank you. Hey Amen. No problem. God bless. You gave me something to think about, too. I appreciate it. All right, Rusty. God bless. Okay, let's get over to Joe from Toledo, Ohio. Hey, Joe. Welcome. You're on the air. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's going. Hanging in there. What do you got? Good. Good, man. I just got a quick, I got a quick thought. I got a quick question for you. Um, Let's get your input on. Uh, So, I'm a born again Christian, all right. But here's the thing, man. Both of my parents are not, all right. Okay. I can't. I come from a family where I, I wasn't really involved in church growing up, and they kind of look at it like it's a religion. My dad was a Catholic, and the Bible says to honor thy, thy father and mother, mm-hmm. but it's hard to deal with them spiritually. Because I feel almost drained to be around them because, you know what I'm saying? It's like I'm, I'm unequally yeah. yoked, and I've yeah. tried to share the gospel with them, and they reject it and reject it, and it's hard. So I just wanted to know, like, what, how, do you, 
How would you deal with a situation like that? Well, you could put sleeping pills in their coffee, and then when they get drowsy, <laughs> when they get drowsy, you can just start talking to them, okay? And they just kind of look at you, and you just do this every day, and uh, you, you, you work it, okay? And you can also right. uh, set the radio station to religious stations, and then when they're asleep, you can take a, a, a tape recorder, you know, with Jesus is God in flesh, you must trust in him, et cetera, and you just play it super soft outside the door, you know? And uh, you know right. that's one thing. Okay, you know you could do that. Yeah. Or what you could do is uh, you could pray, and you could ask God to give you the strength to be able to right. endure being in a home where your parents reject God. And so you will learn a great thing, not, a great man. deal through this. What's that? Yeah, I know, and and, and that's that's good stuff, but. I don't live with him anymore. I live with my wife now oh, okay. in Toledo. It's just, oh, okay. Okay. it's hard to, it's just hard, yeah. man. Like my dad wants to come over and it's like, you, yeah. you know, you know the feeling, man. You know what it's like oh, to yes, be I around do. people who don't have the same beliefs as you. Yeah, I know. And yeah. it's like, it's like, I just, I don't even want him in my house, but I, I it's just hard, man. Well, you know, it's hard being a Christian, man, sometimes. Yes, it is. But think of it this way. You know, I wouldn't want them in the house if they were cussing and using the Lord's name in vain all the time. and They wouldn't stop. They do. All right. Yeah. Well, then, you know, this is what I did. Uh, let's just say uh, my parents, I'll get I'll be very vague. They have passed away and I believe they're both with the Lord. But there was a time they'd come over and, you know, my wife and I were there with our kids and they would use the Lord's name in vain. I told them, you know, I had mom, dad. I love yeah. You, but. Uh, we don't do that in this house, and I mean this very lovingly, very respectfully, but if you don't stop that, you're not going to be welcome back here. I said, I'm the man of the house here, my wife and I agree, and we love you, we want you here, but we can't let our children be exposed to that. And, and, you know, you you sit as politely. They didn't like it, but what are they going to do? Right. And so they right. they actually curtailed it quite a bit. And when they would, it could slip every now and then, I'd give them a stare, and they, they got it. You know, we want them to come over and want them to enjoy the right. grandkids and stuff like that. But you do have to draw the line someplace, and you need to back it up. And yeah. I say they agree to it, and then they come over and they start cussing and do it anyway. You say, I'm sorry, but you need to leave right now. And they go, right. what? And we're right. serious. I said, I, but you have to tell him, look, I love you. I'm trying to honor you, but I have to honor my Lord before I honor you. He's greater than you. Yeah. And I want you to know that you yeah. know, I, we want you back, but you, you can't keep doing this. And, and please, we're just asking you to stop. Okay. It, you know, it, when it, you're it, here, it, you do what you want in your own home. Yeah, you do what you want right. in your own home, but in, in this one, that's different. You're the man of the house. You and your wife need to decide what limits mm-hmm. you're going to going to have and then just politely lovingly enforce them and do it with prayer and they'll get over it they don't like it uh, too bad you're the man and yeah. he'll respect you more for it and it'll work out don't let your wife i'm not going to say that she's an emotional creature overly or whatever but don't let your wife go well we just had to be nice let him in no 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 set the standard right and and just adhere to that standard and it'll work out they'll, they'll adjust okay all right okay hey, we, i appreciate that all right, buddy. Well, God bless. All right, let me know how it goes, yeah, okay? thank you. All right. All right, thank you. All right, you too, man. God bless. Hey, folks, we have uh, three open lines, 877-207-2276. Why don't you give me a call? We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, well, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, it's easy. All you got to do is dial 877-207-2276. Let's get on the air with next longest waiting is Dave from Kansas City. Dave, welcome. You're on the air, buddy. Yeah, I'm the other Dave with the other rotator cuff. Uh, foreign rotator cuff. <laughs> the other we have one. two of okay. us. <laughs> all right, all right. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Anyway, um, you know, uh, as you said, there's so much heresy, so little time. Mm-hmm. What what I'm involved in now is Leighton Flowers. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm Ligon Duncan. I get those mixed up. Ligon Duncan accused um, uh, 
Doug Wilson of Federal Vision being a heresy. Okay. Um, Federal Vision has some problems. I looked it up on Got Questions, and it said it does have lie somewhere outside the boundaries of orthodoxy. But Doug Wilson contends Federal Vision is totally within the boundaries of the Westminster Confession. And I just wanted to hear your take on Federal Vision. The problem uh, that is there with it is the issue of, from what I remember, what I understand, of keeping covenant Mm -hmm. in order to be Mm -hmm. saved. So that's what it comes down to. And so the issue then becomes, what do you do with the aspects of the covenant and which aspects or covenant boundaries are you to keep and which ones are you not? And by keeping certain covenant boundaries, do you then maintain your position with God? Well, if they say yes, then I'm going to call it a false gospel. This is what I say to the Roman Catholics. I say to them, do you Mm -hmm. keep yourself right with the infinitely good God by your efforts, your work, your obedience? And they say, yes, well, that's a false gospel. If someone in the federal vision camp were to say yes, if they were to say it, that yes, they keep themselves right with God by keeping the covenant, then that would be a false gospel. But I, I suspect that they're too smart for that, and they don't really believe that. From what I understand, the aspect of federal vision dealing with covenant deals with the issue, as long as you're inside the covenant boundaries, you are saved. And if you're outside, you're not. But the question I have mm-hmm. is, is it the keeping or the not keeping that brings you in or out? Or is that you're in or out manifests in keeping the covenant boundaries? Then what are those covenant boundaries? Well, yep. some covenant aspects, uh, uh, baptizing infants is acceptable. You know, I, you know mm-hmm. I, I agree. I believe in in the possibility uh, of baptizing infants, but not for salvation. Pedo, pedo, pedo community. Pedo community yeah, they do pedo communion too, which which I, I'll address here. But what I hold to, what a lot of people hold to, who affirm infant baptism inside the Presbyterian Protestant uh, mm-hmm. leaning, is that it's not a saving ordinance, but that it's a covenantal no. sign. The way circumcision was a covenantal sign for the for the children, and that they were entered into Correct. the covenant, but it didn't save them. And so I, I look at those pretty very similarly. All right, so I used to know somebody who uh, practiced uh, infant communion because they believed that in the covenant, uh, infant baptism covenant, they were then able to participate in the covenant of communion as well. And I said, well, the problem with that is that the Bible says he must examine himself before taking the, the communion elements. I said, "Can now here's the question, can an infant do that? And so... He said, well, that's a good point, you know, because we can't say they can or can't. Uh, we don't, we're, you know, we can't, but it doesn't seem to be the case that they can examine themselves, understand what's going on in the hypostatic union and their na- sin nature, repentance, etc. So mm-hmm. I said, it doesn't seem to be consistent uh, for you to be able to, to say that and then have them do that. And so I would reject that on that basis, you know, if it could be. Yeah. Okay. Ligon Duncan made a, I don't know if you probably haven't seen that, but Ligon Duncan made a big stink out of it, which uh, he called it the Moscow mood, and he called them out, which um, uh, James White and Apologia and um, um, Jeff Durbin got involved in it, and it became a big stink within, you know, calling Doug Wilson out, and Ligon Duncan, and, you know, with the uh, Gospel Coalition, called them out, called it the Moscow mood, so you know, maybe Moscow, Idaho. I know Idaho is a big state, but it's not that big population wise. So this battle may be coming to your state near you soon. Yeah. Well, I live in Idaho, and I'm about five hours south of of there. And uh, I know someone who who lives there. And um, you know, I thought about going up there to check things out, but I don't want to just drive up just to check it out. If I'm going to do something like that, I'm going to go there for a reason. And, and, but, uh, but but I do like I do like the public, I, I do like the guys in Moscow. I do like uh, uh, a lot of things Doug does say. Uh, he is crass sometimes, but you know, uh, yeah. Again, I disagree with Doug on some of his his positions. But again, I, I think James White and him, who James White's a Reformed Baptist, seem to bury the hatchet. So I I don't think James White would associate with him if he was a total apostate. Right, and that's what I was saying is is uh, that there are aspects of the federal vision that uh, are varied, and so we're, I believe some can go too far, and mm-hmm. others, which I wouldn't agree with certain procedures personally, it doesn't mean that they're no. in or out, but 
you know, so that's what it comes out of the, the definition and the movement of the extent of the covenant aspect. Okay. That's what well, thank say. you, Matt. Okay. Hope that helps. All right. Okay. Okay, man. Okay, God bless. All right. Now, let's see. Let's get to Jim from North Carolina. Jim, welcome. You're on the air. Hi, Matt. Uh, I'm caller. I appreciate you taking my call. My question is, I've been doing some, um, I guess, concentration on heaven and uh, have studied John Burke and uh, his studies of near-death experiences uh, and bringing that back to Scripture as to the, the consistencies of, uh, of some of the patterns that these people encountered. I just wonder what your take is. Of, do you believe that, that near-death experiences are kind of God's way of giving people a peek as to what is prepared for us so that they can tell others and, and, and convert more people to the kingdom? Well, I don't know if that's his purpose of, of allowing things like that but I think he can use things like that. So I don't know if that's what he's designing it for. I actually f uh, follow every now and then uh, NDEs. And uh, so near-death experiences. And I've read, uh, I think, a couple of books on it, I, or maybe half of each. I don't know. I can't remember. But it's been a while. And when we go to 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, it says, I know a man in Christ, that means he's saved, who, 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body I do not know, God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. And he says, on behalf of such a man, I'll boast. Now, I think he was referring to himself, but Paul, that's just an opinion. But nevertheless... So we see what can be categorized here as an NDE, where a mm -hmm. person, so to speak, leaves their body and goes up to heaven. And it certainly seems to be the case right there in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. So because of that, I then can look at some of the NDEs uh, as not being unbiblical. Then what I have to do is look at the content. And so when mm -hmm. NDEs talk about repentance, a person comes back and is repentant becomes a Christian okay thumbs up when they say the divine essence of the ethereal presence we're all one with God then I know it's demonic so hold on I've got a break okay mm -hmm. hey folks we'll be right back after these messages we'll continue to talk about NDEs and a little bit more because there's more info about them may the Lord bless you be right back please stay tuned It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. Let's get back with Jim from North Carolina, buddy. Are you still there? I am here. It was interesting that you brought up Corinthians, because I was going to ask you, as, it, as some believe, that you talked last week about how Paul had such a radical, uh, you know, transformation and uh, why that doesn't happen more? Why? why. Yeah. But some believe that 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 because of that radical transformation, that he had an NDE. That whether he got knocked off the horse and that happened, or I believe he was stoned at one time and they thought he was dead, but he you know yes. stood up and came back. Yes, and that's why I suspect. That's all I can do is suspect that the stoning he received is the occurrence of his NDE. And the knock, being knocked off the horse and blinded by the bright light might be an occasion of him being blinded or have faulty vision because he says in one of the epistles, and I forgot which one, he says, see that I write this with my own hand in which large letters or something like that. So some conclude mm. that maybe he had bad vision because of it. These are just you know points of interest. I uh, can't prove them. So aside from that, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure, but... Um, uh, I think that there's some... Oh, you know what's interesting? It's, it's the, I just remember this. The thing that really kind of got me was when I was reading some books on this that medical professionals cited the uh, some issues of people born blind 
and had been they'd never seen they had never had vision and they were either a car accident or surgery in a hospital and they had an NDE and they saw people they went to different rooms in the hospital were able to recognize people by their voices apparently and then when they recovered they described what they saw and there is just no way that they could have because they'd never seen before but yet they described people and were able to you know they deduced a lot but what's this is and they could see things oh that's what that looks like and this is what this is and they recognized people who were next to each other and in different rooms and it's verified so that to me is is pretty solid proof that these things are at least some of them are legit now what about the demonic ones that's the issue i remember seeing reading one about a, a I think I remember it was a girl or a guy. I think it was a woman. Howard Storm is the one that was an atheist that uh, went the other way. And uh, went the other way. Yeah, when he was he Christian, went, uh, Christian. He gave he, he gave his NDE of when he went to when he went to hell. Yes. And the well, gnashing of teeth. I mean, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. I remember reading a story about. A, I think it was a woman. She was in a car accident, and the car went into a pond. And was submerged and a guy uh, jumped in and and pulled her out but during this period of time she woke up uh, in a place and there were these creatures after her and she said it was real she said it wasn't like a dream she said they were there she was fully conscious and she was awake and she was terrified and I sort of then she I don't know if he became a Christian but I do know of another guy who um, he actually went to the bad place for a while and he was revived and he's a Christian now. So, yeah. yeah. Very interesting yeah. stuff. If somebody wants to look at it, Pastor John Burke did a real good, real good study on it. Imagine Heaven. You can Google it. It's on YouTube. It's very, very unique stuff. Along with Lee Strobel, he did a whole series on it. Oh, good. Okay, good. Thanks, man. All right, man. Okay, buddy. Well, thanks for calling. All right. Okay, God bless. All right. Now, next longest waiting is Andrew from Dayton, Ohio. Andrew, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, how you doing today? Oh, hanging in there. Hanging in there, man. Hanging in there. Uh Uh-huh. Well, me and my wife were discussing this uh, just a little while ago, is that the night that Jesus was betrayed, he told his disciples to go and make ready for the Passover because he desired to eat the Passover with them. And then they went to the Garden of Gethsemane and was betrayed and taken to the Sanhedrin. But then after the Sanhedrin, uh, Caiaphas, they took him to uh, Pilate's uh, Praetorium, or however you say it. And, uh, yep. and uh, the Pharisees, Caiaphas, would not go in because they said they didn't want to defile themselves because they wanted to eat the Passover. Okay. And so it's confusing because it seems almost as if there's two Passovers to make this oh, wow. uh, work. That's a so very good observation. Yeah, and I've heard that that in Ju- some Jewish and I didn't. I remember reading about it that there was an occasion for two Passovers, and it's been so long, so long. Yeah, I'm trying to remember it. But yeah, there, there was an argument of two Passovers for different reasons, and well, I hadn't even thought of it in a was, long time. Okay. What I heard is that I just don't, I, I can't grab a hold of it, but something to do with the Galilean Jews held that the day began with the sun rising mm-hmm. and the sun setting, kind of like what we do today. But the the uh, Orthodox Jews, I guess, believe that. You know, in the Old Testament, is that the evening and the morning were the right. first day, and so the day begins right. in the evening. And so, there's something to do with that, but I'm not. I can't really come to a solid conclusion on how Jesus mm-hmm. kept the Passover. Is the Passover lamb? But then Caiaphas and the gang still wanted to keep the Passover and not be defiled by it. Right. It's hard to. I don't know if yes. you have answers. Now the thing is that. Uh, for the Romans, the day changed at midnight. For the Jews, the day changed 
at sundown, which let's just, for the sake of argument, say was 6 p.m. So right. there would be several hours of difference where for the Jews it would be the 12th and uh, it would be the 13th, for example, but for the the, Jew, the Romans it would be the 12th. You know, So there, there's a possibility right. there that it could be, have been mentioned in different senses from the perspective of, of the different viewers. Now, that's possible if the gospel writers are writing it from the perspective to teach the unbelievers and they say it was on this day or the second or when he did it over and it could be a confusion there but there's it, yeah. it's under debate it's been debated and it does, yeah. does not seem to be a solution to it it's just one of those things in the bible you go what what was going on <laughs> and maybe we'll find some documents you know written uh, back then oh, you know the, the two passovers were begun you know 80 years ago at the event of whatever and they would argue you know m- maybe you never know things like this happened so we'll okay. just see well like yeah. the only easy solution that i was thinking you know how jesus he said i'm the lord of the sabbath well he's obviously the yeah. lord of the passover and he's the passover right. lamb so if he wanted to observe it at a different time he's he is God, so he can do whatever he wants. But a lot of people say that that's not a possibility because he's going to fulfill it perfectly. Well, so yes, he had to. It, he had to difficult. do it under yeah. the law. He had to yeah. fulfill the law. So he couldn't uh-huh. break that law. So he had to do it according to the scriptures because he was a man under the yeah. law. Okay? But, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, brother. appreciate it. Hey, man, you're welcome. God bless. All right. God bless you. Okay. All right. Now, next longest waiting is Ryan from Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Ryan. You're on the air. Um, thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to make an observation. I um, was listening to a rerun of one of your shows, and um, I think it was toward the end of one of your shows or some of your after comments. You were talking about theonomy, and um, you were very cautious about um, your um, your your views of theonomy and how it should be implemented and so forth. I wanted to compliment you on that because not a lot of people um, are cautious about what theonomy is and how it's supposed to be implemented and uh, the the conflicts that a Christian could have if they have political power. Um, that's a very, very serious discussion that needs to be had mm-hmm. before someone, but before a Christian does take political power. Right. And um, when I looked into theonomy years ago, one of the things that I noticed was like right after the Reformation, uh, there was a great many um, wars that went on in Europe that were, that were called the European uh, Wars of Religion. Um, and we can see that it's uh, contrary to what Doug Wilson teaches. It's literally millions of Christians killing other Christians for um, a couple of centuries. And um, it, it, this is a very serious history, and it's a very serious question. But um, I, I thought your measured response to it um, I I found quite compelling, and I um, I just wanted to compliment you on that because it showed a great deal of thought that you put into it. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I I have a philosophy that I think is pretty much uh, perfect. If you want to mess something up, you just need two things: people and time. I think it's pretty much mm-hmm. a guaranteed thing, and so. If we have a bunch of people who are beautiful Christians, beautiful Christians, wise, who study the Word of God, and they're in control of an entire nation, I think there'd be a lot of harmony. What happens when they die and their children come in and successors? Eventually, it's going to go bad. We've got to be very wary. Well, right yeah. Now. Oh, hey, there's a break. And, Hold I mean, on, we can take... we got a break. Hold on. Right. Hold on, Ryan. Okay. Hey, folks. Oops. I'm on. Okay, there we go. Um, hey, folks. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the last segment of the hour. Let's get back on with Ryan. Okay, Ryan, welcome. Sorry about the break, but there we are. Um, I appreciate you letting me hang on. Um, you know, the, the um, you know, you take a look at, like, John Calvin, uh, when he was in political power, he certainly had some abuses. You take a look at Oliver Cromwell, um, far and away more corrupt than his secular counterparts, um, and John Knox. I mean, there are innumerable examples of Christians with political power 
that completely abuse their political power. And so mm-hmm. it's, I, I agree with you that it's something that we really, really need to take seriously and to question in great, uh, great detail. You know, as an example, let's say that um, a Christian man um, uh, becomes a congressman, gets elected to, be, to being a congressman. Well, what is his responsibility to people who um, have a belief that is directly contradictory or hostile to his theology? What is his political responsibility, and how does he, um, how much compromise is allowable uh, to his theology yep. for the sake of politics? These are very serious questions. Yes, they are. And, yes, you know, and, and questions that um, all too often, you know, we, we fall behind terms like theonomy, Christian nationalism, and a whole slew of other terms like that, and just kind of go in wholeheartedly and say, yeah, this is the way to go. Really, really taking a close look at what this entails and, um, and the, you know, the historic problems that Christians have had when they have political power. So, like I say, I yeah. was really impressed with your, um, your cautious approach and your, um, your questioning of these things, because that is not done very often. Well, I, I need to be cautious, because I imagine myself in absolute control and power. What would I do? I mean, this is a mental exercise. And you quickly run aground. I don't have the wisdom for something like that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I thought, okay, well, I'd make it so that Christianity is promoted in schools, but not other religions. Well, is that fair? You know, it's like, oh, my goodness. So it just becomes a a maze of difficulties. And I'm glad that God's in control and not me. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, like I said, I've listened to... um, a lot of folks who call themselves Christian nationalists and different things. And, um, and this is just something that is just a, um, a it, it's fraught with a lot of potholes. And uh, yes. it's uh, when you feel like that God has put you in that position and you have God's authority behind you and you have political power, this is very, very dangerous. Yeah, it is. I don't think it'd be as dangerous as atheists being in absolute power since in the 1900s, over 100 million people were killed under atheist regimes well, so yeah. well um the um uh you know there, there's no doubt that um you know any sort of authoritarian who has absolute power is going to be a problem there's no question about that and um you know and i'm certainly not suggesting that um but like i say there's there's just a lot of things that are being um uh just kind of rushed shot over and uh, not taken very seriously when we're starting to promote these sorts of things. But I mean, you know, James Madison, uh, you know, the guy who wrote the Constitution, he said the reason that we that the um, we have um, separation of church and state was because of the wars that went on in Europe and stained the, the soil of Europe for centuries. Mm-hmm. So the uh, you know, as um, uh, corrupt as things can be, it seems like the idea of, of okay, just no national church and no uh, national religion is a good place to begin you know and um but anyway i like i say i um uh, i just did not find a lot of people being as careful as you were in your wording and your um and your approach to it and like i say i I wanted to commend you for that and compliment you for that well thank you appreciate it all right have a good day you too thank you all right. Well, now let's see who's next longest, and that's Grant from Utah. Hey, Grant, welcome. You are on the air. How you doing, brother? Oh, hang um, in there, man. My question, yeah, my question is about uh, the Book of Enoch. Okay. Is there a um, any validity in it? Well, that's a tough question. Is there any validity or truth in it? Of course there is. You know, you, I, I've written a, a science fiction novel. Is there any truth in it? Well, of course there is. So when you right. when you ask that kind of question in relation to that kind of a book, I think a rephrase of the question might be something like, is it inspired of God? No, it's not. Right. Does it? However, does it have truth in it? Well, of course it does, just like the apocryphal books do, but they're not inspired either. And of course, there's errors right. in the apocryphal books. But, you know, yeah. so, yeah, there, there's truth in it. And it's the Book of Enoch is worth looking at. But uh, I would recommend that people view it as non-scriptural. And some people think, well, uh-huh. because Jude quotes the Book of Enoch, uh, then it must be inspired. Right. Well, no, because there are lots of books 
that the Bible refers to that are not inspired. I've got an article. I think there's like 21 books in mm-hmm. in uh, the Bible that I've found anyway through re- reading and, and research that uh, are mentioned but are not inspired. The Book of the War of the Lords or, or War of the Kings or something like that, for example. It's not inspired. It's just a, a document that it was referenced while the inspired writer was gathering information. And Paul the Apostle quoted pagan philosophers of Epimenides, Menander, and Erastus. Doesn't mean they're inspired, right? So, okay. Yeah, I, the only reason why I was asking because I'm um, I've been looking into the um, the Nephilim, <clears throat> and apparently okay. the Book of Enoch talks about the Nephilim, Nephilim a lot. That's yeah. the reason why I was asking if a lot of this Book of Enoch is talking about that, and if you know, I I'm leaning more towards believing in that what the the fallen angels have have done or have been yeah. that's the biblical position that's what i've seen is that the fallen angels mm-hmm. had relations with women and produced offspring and that's the nephilim that seems to be the case out of Gen- genesis chapter 6 and verse 9 it says that right. abraham was perfect in all his generations and what's interesting is that Jesus says, in the ways, as it was the days of Noah, so shall it be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So it'll be similar conditions. And when you go to Daniel chapter 2 with the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, where the top is gold and then silver down there and then uh, uh, down to the brass clay. and then iron and clay. Yeah, the iron and clay, you know, is our time, as, yeah. as a lot of as, uh, experts say. Well, it's mixed, you know, they're mixed, but it says in uh, 243 of Daniel, it says, they will combine with one another in the seat of men. Well, what does that mean? It, it seems to be an implication in support of the Nephilim things going on again at the end, where demonic manifestations are going to be occurring in physical form. So people say, well, that's ridiculous. Well, it's not ridiculous. It happened in Genesis 6. The, the Jews always taught it. The Christian church taught it till the 5th century. So there's a lot of warrant to believe it. Okay. And, and today, there's more UFO sightings, more creatures that are that they say that never existed are coming up and there's a lot of things that are coming up just like the Bible said at the end of the days there's going to be mm-hmm. um, you know stuff coming out yes yes yeah there's a, a lot of stuff and uh, the Bible talks about right. it and we have to be careful not to submit the teachings of scripture to the sensibilities of human um, desires or political correctness or whatever. Uh, I right, hold to the right. Nephilim being the offspring, half of the fallen angels, because uh, that's what I see in Scripture. And that's my honest view. So that's uh, what it is. Yeah, I'm starting to believe that now, because at first I was just like, eh, it doesn't really make sense to me until I kind of read some of the book of Enoch and started making me like, okay, uh, if there's a record of it, then there's got to be some truth in it. Well, the it's truth like must be found in Scripture. The, that's how you know the Book of right. Enoch has any validity if it agrees with Scripture. Okay, so that's what you got to do guess, there. I guess I'm saying more, more evident and more um, um, facts. I guess you would say. Well, just additional information. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and okay. you know, I'm just I'm curious about a lot of things that I've I'm I'm, I'm reading like. You know, like for the book of Revelation, it talks about when he said, look at the look at those that made it through the great tribulation. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it's, it's saying that they went through the tribulation and didn't say they escaped it from the pre-trib rapture nonsense. Right. Uh, because yeah. mm-hmm. you, you get what I mean? Yes, I know what you mean. Uh, I do understand. But... Uh, there's, there are different views, and uh, I try to be gracious to the people who mm-hmm. have differing views. But there you go, and uh, I think you're on, you're right on track with that. And uh, there you go. Okay. And you know, you, you know, the Bible talks about the remnant. Mm-hmm. All all through the the book, the the Bible talks about the remnant. Yes. Noah, Lot. Yes. Um, um, how many? How many of the um, the people that came out of Egypt? How many have made it to the promised land not very much the remnant. yeah now you're opening up another topic here but which is a deep topic yeah, i'm just saying but, I, I, a lot of things I've, i'm reading that i'm finding out 
We're good. But we're good. Just keep studying. Um, Just keep reading. Okay. We got another caller I wanted to okay, get to well, before the end yeah. of the the show. Here, we only got a couple of minutes All left, right, or three minutes left. All right, thank okay, you, buddy. Sir. All right, man. Well, God bless. Bye. All right. Okay, now let's get to Alberto from Georgia. Alberto, welcome. You are on the air. Yes, I, yeah. My my question is: Would a false preacher who's, who's preaching? Falsely, and if America comes on mass of persecution, and the false preacher is willing to give his life to, to, for the cause of Christ, get his head cut off, would he still go to heaven? Even though he's a false preacher? You, you, I, I'm having difficulty understanding you. Are you saying does a false well, teacher a, go to heaven? Would a, 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 a false teacher would be willing to get his head cut off if, if massive persecution comes to America. And well, you're saying, have, would a particular... No, 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 the question is difficult because you're saying, would a particular false teacher be willing to do such and such? I can't answer that kind of question. don't know what they would or would not be. Yeah, because, uh, because they don't know there are false teachers. Some do know. Some think they're teaching truth and that they're really teaching error. So they think they really are a Christian. Teaching, teaching truth and what Matt the preacher, preacher comes to America well, if he has to give his head cut off for the cause of Christ we're still going to have it even though he's a false preacher well no if he's a false teacher depends on what he's false teaching in if he denies the deity of Christ he's not going to heaven but many false teachers will die for their faith as, for example in Islam they'll die for their faith so just make it, make it right so the issue is what are they teaching what are they affirming that's what the ultimate issue is there that's what you look at okay but before the core doctrine, they might be teaching truth, but in other areas, they teach falsely. So long as the core right, and that's one of the issues that we have to look doctrine. at. Right. Okay. What is the? Yeah. You know, okay. That's one of the issues we got to look at. Right. What is? Uh, what would they be teaching? Is it audiophora or is it in the essentials? I know you both. So, okay. There's a lot of noise in the background there. All right. So. Um, I know. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Bye bye. That help. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Yeah, man, God bless. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. All bye-bye. right. Okay, bye. All right, folks, we've got, uh, what, about 15 seconds left. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you uh, want to continue to listen, you got to wait until tomorrow. And I just want to just uh, let you know that we do stay on the air by your support. If you'd be so kind as to help us out a little, all you have to do is go to carm.org forward slash donate, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G, carm dot org forward slash donate. You can set it up, and we ask 5 maybe $10 a month. It does help us, and we are able to set up uh, budgets with that kind of thing. We'll be know what's coming in. May the Lord bless you, and uh, I'll be on a debate tonight. So that's in about an hour from now. Just go to carm.org forward slash calendar for the information, forward slash calendar. God bless everybody. Another program powered by the Truth Network.